Hi, this is the third of the three lecture snippets on using integration method to calculate electric field due to an extended body. So this is the third example that I usually don't do in class because um, usually by this point we've wasted enough time trying to do this and it was time for me to illustrate Gauss's law method. But this is a video, you can watch it, you don't have to watch it, so I thought it would be fun to do it. Now, this is mathematically the most uh, complicated, but I think this is a good opportunity for me to explain some of the multivariable calculus stuff that I skipped over in the last example. So, give it a watch. So, the example I want to work out here is electric field due to uniformly charged sphere. So, let me start out with the illustration of the sphere. Let me draw the picture large enough so that I can label different parts of the vector and so on. Uh, let me start out with the axis first actually. So the axis will look like x-axis here, y-axis, and z-axis. So the sphere would look something like this, of radius r, and let me just draw a little circle here as a reminder that it's a solid sphere, not just a circle. Alright, so as a reminder, these are my axes, x, y, and z. Let's say that the radius of the sphere is capital R. I'm going to need two different variables to indicate two different vectors. Um, traditionally, people use lowercase r and r, lowercase r prime, but I think the prime is going to get lost easily. So let me use a slightly non-standard label. So the question here is this. So given a point here, for example, what is the electric field at this point? Let me indicate the uh, position of this point with a vector. So this will be my vector r. Now, I am going to need to count a contribution from all the different parts of this uniformly charged sphere. So let me take a little chunk here, for example. So I'm trying to take a chunk in a way it uh, conforms with the spherical um, symmetry of the setup. I will describe in a bit how this chunk is exactly taken. But it comes down to I need some letter symbol to describe what is the position of this chunk. And that's going to be a vector also. And this is the one that's traditionally labeled as R prime. Um, once again, I'm afraid the prime will get lost here and there. So let me use the letter S to indicate this position here. Once again, this is going to be slightly non-standard. Um, when you take upper division electrodynamics, letter S is actually used for the radius in cylindrical coordinate system, but um, so go with it for this one, please. So, um, all right, so that's the setup. Um, and once again, the problem is that I have all these different points contributing to the electric field at this point here. So I need to use Coulomb's law with these infinitesimal portions of uniformly charged sphere. Let me write it down on the side as a reminder. Small contribution to the electric field is equal to K times the uh, small amount of charge in that part that's contributing divided by distance squared. So here the distance is best represented by a vector going from the tip of S to the tip of R. This is the distance vector. Let me call that 
well, d vector. Now, as you look at this, um, if you're thinking, oh, expression for that unit vector that I used to draw, the unit vector, you know, pointing this way, r hat, if you're thinking that's going to be complicated, well, you'll be right. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this expression so that I can more easily mathematically express this in full form. So before this is what we used to do. We would say, all right, so this is actually a vector and there's going to be this r hat that I'll define later. Well, let me take it back. So it is going to be a vector. But the thing about this r hat here, what's special is that, well, it's the vector going along the direction of d. So, well, let's replace that with not r hat, but d. That'll give me the correct direction for the correct direction um, for the direction of this small contribution to the electric field. Now then, I this d vector is not unit vector. It doesn't have a length of one, so I need to fix that. The way I would fix it is by dividing it by the absolute value of d. Now. Mathematically, the best way to represent it is this way. So let me do it here. Instead of d squared here, I'm going to write it this way. The vector d, that product with itself, so that's the length of d squared. Um, hmm. I'm going to need square root of this and then three of those factors. Two of them for Coulomb's law and one of them to cancel out this length of the d vector, giving me um, effectively the unit vector. So I'm going to say this is going to be raised to power of 3 half. All right, so this is the form of Coulomb's law that I'm going to use for this problem. It will help me set up an integral. The integral will look hopelessly complicated, and I'll resort to uh, Mathematica again. <laughs> All right, uh, so I should do some intermediate work. So um, so let me start out by writing down what these s, r, and d vectors are in terms of x hat, y hat, and z hat. Let's start there. Um, r is the easiest to write down, so let's do that. So, so the vector r is going to be, it only has the z component, no x or y component. So I could write that this is equal to its own magnitude r without the vector, times z hat. That's the vector r. All right, vector s. Now, that one's a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to use spherical coordinate system. So in the spherical coordinate system, um, this is the way we label it in the physics class. We label the coordinates the angle of the vector that it makes with the z-axis, we label that theta. That's the angle that your uh, multivariable calculus class would label phi. We just swap those letters. It's just different conventions. And for the other angle, I have to consider the projection of the vector s onto the xy plane. So let's say this is the projection. I know in the um, this figure, it's kind of hard to see. So once you take the projection, which would have length um, s sine theta, then I find this angle here. And this angle is what I would label phi. Once again, your math class and physics class will just have two different conventions. So we do these two angles and the distance from the origin, we um, can specify this vector. And when you do, uh, this is the expression that you get for this vector s. It's the same expression that you saw last time, except with the length uh, s. So it's going to be for the x component, s cosine phi times sine of theta x hat plus for the y component, s sine of phi times sine theta y hat plus for the g component as cosine 
theta t hat. All right, we are almost there. We need an expression for d. And this figure gives the best way to get at d. d is the vector connecting tip of s hat to r hat, which means we could actually say this. We can say that the vector d is actually given by difference between these two vectors. So adding it back, it should be r minus s. I know this is correct because if I add this back to s, then I should get r. That's what you see. s plus d gives you r. All right, so that's d. Um, I, I can write it out in the component form. In that case, oh, let me move it over here first. Okay, so the d vector is going to be equal to so it's the s that has all the components and r has only one so it's going to be minus s cosine phi times sine of theta x hat minus s sine of phi sine of theta y hat plus r minus s cosine theta t hat. All right, that's the d vector. I think we have everything we need to um, write out this um, infinitesimal contribution to the electric field. Um, so, oh, I should probably specify the charge density of this sphere. Let's say that the charge density of sphere is given by density rho. Um, remember the symbol Greek letter rho that we use for density, uh, mass density? We also use it for charge density. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the small, so looking at the contribution from this small element here, what we are saying is that the contrib small contribution to electric field de as a vector is equal to k times the small amount of charge that's going to be the density times what's going to be called volume element i will work out this volume element in on a separate page because that itself is a little bit of multivariable calculus that you have to know for this question so i will uh, do it on a separate page after I finish writing this down. Um, this divided by, I have the denominator here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the d vector here, take that product with itself, which means x component squared plus y component squared plus d component squared, and then raise to power of 3 half. All right, I'm going to have to move this down a little bit. Uh, all right. So... This is um, x component, s squared, cosine squared phi, sine squared theta, plus the y component, s squared, sine squared phi, plus, um, times sine squared theta, plus the z component squared. So that's r minus s cosine theta squared. All right, all of this raised to power of three halves. All right, it looks like I'm kind of running low on space. So um, I think I can still write out, can I still write out d here? Um, all right, let me just write d as a vector here. Okay, d is a vector here. Um, if you stare at this for a while, you'll realize you can actually simplify some of this a little bit. So let's do that. Um, I see cosine squared phi and the rest are the same as here except for the sine squared phi, which means you can imagine writing this down. So this would simplify into s squared factor out sine squared theta times cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi. 
and this is just one. So um, I can combine the x and y uh, components here and get a simpler term. And I guess I can leave it up uh, at that point for now. And I'll come back to the rest. All right. So simplify. Um, let me erase this to make room for it. All right, so simplify what I have here. K O D V over S squared sine squared theta. This is the result of combining X and Y component. Plus the G component is still there. R minus S cosine theta raised to power of 2. The whole thing raised to power of 3 halves. All right, now I think I have room for D, so let's write it down. D is given by minus S cosine phi sine theta x hat minus S sine phi sine theta y hat plus R minus S cosine theta t hat. All right, that's the vector d. Okay, I believe this is the time to address this dv. So let me bring up a new page and we'll talk about it. All right, on this new page, I have my sphere drawn even bigger so that I can uh, draw more clear figures to talk about it. Uh, let's say we are talking about a volume element that's just about um, on the surface of this sphere. Um, that doesn't make it any less general um, since I can sort of imagine imaginary spheres that's smaller than capital R and do it for, yeah. Okay, so if you would like, you could consider this to be the sphere of radius S for the uh, particular radius S that you're considering. So this is what's called volume element, dv. And I'd like to label each of the sides and see if each of those sides makes sense. All right. So one side is pretty easy to label. It's if you have uh, this S vector pointing out here, then you can label this side here. That's the thickness of the sphere or spherical shell or I could call this ds. That's how much s would vary within the volume. All right. I need to get two more sides, this side here and this side here. Now, the first side I drew is actually easier because you know that um, this is part of an arc of a circle that goes from pole to pole. So if you imagine drawing a gray circle, that goes from pole to pole, then this length would be the radius of the circle, S, times the angular displacement. So this is what I can call S d theta. So that's the length of that side. Now, length of this side is a little bit trickier. You have to imagine taking a projection of all of this onto the xy plane so let's say this is the xy plane. And that length that I have drawn up there, it's represented by this. So here the radius is actually not s. Here the radius is s sine theta. So this projection here, so this projection here would be s sine theta times the small change the angle phi, d phi. So with all of that, this side here is s sine theta d phi. So this is a quick overview of the spherical coordinate system. You are not expected to know this for this class. You will be learning it in your multivariable calculus. So the volume element is essentially product of these three sides. The idea is that when you're talking about infinitesimal volume, as long as these are all relatively perpendicular to each other, then we don't care that they are all curved. If you take the small enough sides, then the fact that it's curved shouldn't matter. So I can say the volume element dv is equal to product of 
ds times sd theta times s sin theta d phi. Or if you want to make this all look pretty, you could say this is equal to factor out the two factors of s in front, s squared, and I have one function of theta, sine theta, and all the infinitesimals together, ds, d theta, d phi. So that's it. That's the volume element. Let me go back to the other page and uh, plug this in. All right, so I'm ready to plug in the volume element. So let me erase this dv and plug in the volume element. It's a, what I wrote before. So it's going to be um, s squared times sine theta and then all the infinitesimals ds, d theta, d phi. All right, that's it. So to get the total electric field, so this is the infinitesimal electric field, and if I want the, the total contribution, then I would integrate this over the volume of sphere. So this is going to be a triple integral. Uh, it's... Uh, so it's integral with respect to ds, d theta, and d phi. And when I finish that, then I'm going to get the total electric field E. So I'm going to go over the integral with respect to other two variables in a bit. But let me first consider the integral with respect to phi. So phi is the angle along the x, y plane. It goes from 0 all the way around. To 2 pi. So phi will go from 0 to 2 pi. And if you stare at this expression long enough, then you realize something. A lot of the expressions here, they don't depend, depend on phi. In fact, there are only two terms that actually depends on phi. Here, the x component here, and here, the y component here. And in particular, they depend on as cosine of phi. What do you think you will get when you integrate cosine of phi over a whole period, 0 to 2 pi? If you said 0, you are right. Yeah. So this term is going to vanish. The x component is going to go to 0. And the same thing happens with the sine of phi. When you integrate it from 0 to 2 pi, it's going to get, give you 0. And there's no other phi terms there. So phi integral is really that simple. And it really that simply um, evaluates to 0 for x and y component. Hopefully, that makes intuitive sense. When you look at this setup here, well, we said that this is the sphere and the point is here. Hopefully, your intuition tells you that the electric field only points in the z direction. That's what this mathematical cancellation is showing. So that's good, actually. Uh, we were able to get some meaningful result out of it. Um, so, me, so let me actually write down the, this simplified expression here. Let me scroll further down and write down. All right. So the electric field. Uh, let me just say z component of electric field, since that's the only component that will be remaining. That's going to be equal to integral. Um, let's be careful here. Uh, I want to do the s integral last. So let me call this ds. Uh, s is going to go from 0, very center of sphere, to the whole radius of the sphere, r. And then I'm going to do the d theta integral next. I mean, before s integral. So theta is actually going to go from 0 to this is where you have to be careful. When you look at this sphere here, so we said to cover all the points, a phi would cover 2 pi. Now, once you decide that, then theta, it only needs to go from positive g to negative g. If it goes over again, it's going to retrace the points that it has already done. So theta actually goes from 0 to pi, not 0 to 2 pi. So. Let me write that down. 
So theta will go from 0 to pi. All right. And I still have d phi integral. I said, you know, doing the phi integral would get rid of x and y component. But we have to keep it for the g component. So phi, as we discussed before, will go from 0 to 2 pi. This will be the d phi integral. All right. Let's uh, write down the whole integrand. It's going to be k rho times s squared sine theta. Uh, oh, I have all those terms there. So let me write that down. R minus s cosine theta. Mm -hmm. I guess that's it. Um, I don't need to write g hat since I'm talking about g component. Divided by s squared sine squared theta plus r minus s cosine theta squared whole thing raised to the power of three halves. All right, um, anybody here know how to do this integral? I don't. And actually, before starting on this video, I tried doing this on Ofram Alpha. Um, Ofram Alpha runs out of time. So I'm actually going to have to do this on Mathematica. And I will explain as I enter this exact expression into Mathematica. All right, so I'm trying to evaluate the integrand. Um, so I know what the result of the d phi integral will be. And I have some hope that ds integral will actually be simple. The integral that I'm worried about is theta. So let me do that. So I will write down everything except k and the density. So what I want to do is I want to integrate s squared times sine theta times r minus s cosine theta. The whole thing divided by s squared sine theta squared plus r minus s cosine theta raised to the power of 2 the whole thing raised to the power of 3 halves. And we want to evaluate this for theta. That's the one I'm trying to do, one I'm worried about. So theta going from 0 to pi. All right, I'm going to hit evaluate. And it's going to take a long time. So I will just uh, um, edit this video. Oh, so after about, let's see, after about three minutes of calculation, that's the answer that I'm getting. What is that? Um, so as you look at the conditions that the Mathematica is giving you, I hope you realize that Mathematica was treating these variables S and R as way more general than we were thinking. I mean, we know what S and R are. They are radius, they are positive numbers. In fact, we can even say R is greater than S. So we know all that. Uh, Mathematica doesn't know that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo the calculation. Same integrate, but this time I'm going to tell Mathematica to assume. Assuming that, well, for one, S is greater than zero, and R is going to be always greater than zero, um, S because it's outside the sphere. Okay, assuming that, do the calculation again. Hopefully this time it won't take quite as long. All right, so we get our answer after only about 30 seconds. Um, so, all right, that's our answer. So this is the result of the theta integral. So let me use this to simplify the expression we had before, and maybe I can do the rest of the integrals myself. All right, the result of doing the theta integral was 2s squared over r squared for all this complicated expression here. 
So let me write that down first. So k rho times 2s squared over r squared. All right, let me write down the rest of the remaining integrals. So I still have the ds integral going from 0 to r. I still have the phi integral going from 0 to 2 pi. And you know what? The rest of this integral seems doable. So for phi, all this expression does not depend on phi. So it just works out to be multiplying by 2 pi. The integral with respect to s, well, s squared, I know how to integrate that. So let me write out. So multiplication by 2 pi for the phi integral times. Um, let me write out all the constants that I would factor out. So that would be 2k rho over r squared. And now the antiderivative of the s squared. Well, that's going to be... Uh, one third s raised to um, third power evaluated from 0 to r. All right, let's plug all this in and see what we get. So we get, let me factor out k and r squared out to the front. k divided by r squared. And what's remaining is, all right, uh, 2 pi times 2, so 4 pi. Um, divided by 3 times, uh, let's see, what do I have, have remaining? Oh, r plugs into s, so r cubed times uh, rho, density. Does anything look familiar? Yeah. So this is just the total volume of sphere, which means volume times the charge density all this is the charge of the sphere. So you get this result. Electric field due to the uniformly charges the sphere at some point distance r from the origin is equal to k times charge of the sphere divided by r squared. Well, that's uh, what we would have gotten if uh, we were dealing with the point charge at the origin. And some of you might recall this from Physics 4A, that with the gravitational forces, if you are dealing with the spherical uh, bodies, then you could uh, treat it as if all the masses were at their centers. Well, this is why. <laughs> we didn't do this calculation in Physics 4A, but, um, well, we just did it in uh, Physics 4B using the electrostatic force, which has mathematically identical form to the gravitational force. All right, so this is it. Uh, that's it. That's the simple result. Let me scroll up and just write this down. So the electric field due to the sphere here. Well, when you finish all the calculation, then uh, result you get is electric field is equal to k over r squared. And if you want to write your answer in terms of what's given here, then the volume 4 pi over 3 times r cubed times the charge density. That's it. That's the electric field due to a uniformly charged sphere. And um, you saw how mathematically complicated this was. Um, You're going to see with Gauss's law how simple this becomes. In fact, this is the simplest application example for Gauss's law. Um, and it, really, this is the reason why we will spend a little bit of time covering Gauss's law. And this is why Gauss's law will be so important um, for the rest of electrostatics. It shows you how with the exploitation of symmetry, you can do a problem in a, such a more simple way than you could do with it, anything else, really. All right. I'll see you all in class. And... Um, until then, bye.